If you like betting on sports, big thanks to MyBookie.com for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. If you go to MyBookie.com right now and enter the code GAS, as in Past Gas, MyBookie will double your first deposit up to a thousand bucks. That's that's free money. Why wouldn't you do that? Over at MyBookie.com, it's winning season. What does that mean, Joe? Winning season means doubling your first deposit. It means survivor, super contests, and squares, all your favorite ways of betting. Winning season means hitting all your parlays and props with your feet up while you're with your homies watching your games. It's simple. You make your picks, you win big, you collect a lot. You collect your cash. From live betting to championship futures, every time you want to make a play, head over to MyBookie.com. Every play you want to make is waiting over at MyBookie.com. And don't forget to enter the code GAS so my bookie will match your deposit up to a thousand bucks. Free money. Thanks, my bookie. What would Donut Media have been before YouTube? There's a good chance it would have been Donut Magazine. Instead of video series, wheelhouse and up to speed would be regular print features. There'd be a quiz on whether or not your high car or your low car. James would have a column called James's notes where he explains the oil crisis over and over every single issue. And instead of YouTube comments, we'd have letters to the editor about how we needed up to speed on Dale Earnhardt Sr. or, you know, some minutia that we got wrong. Donut Magazine never existed. But what if I told you that one of the earliest influences on Donut Media and how we talk about cars was and is a magazine? And furthermore, what if I added that the magazine in question is not written in English, but in Japanese. Today on Past Gas, we're talking about the legendary OG of the Japanese tuner scene, Option Magazine. How did Option start? Who founded it? And how did Option come to have such a massive underground influence on everything that followed it? That's the cover story on today's Kaka Nugasu, that's Japanese for Past Gas, and our latest issue drops now. Past Gas Podcast, it's about cars, it's not about ports. Kakanu Gasu! Kakanu Gasu! It's about cars, it's not about farts! <laughs> I thought, dude, for a split second, I was like, oh my god, James is about to do the rest of that theme song in Japanese. Oh yeah, I just speak, I speak Japanese, I speak Mandarin, <laughs> I speak... <laughs> just everything, you speak every language perfectly. Yeah. So, welcome back to Pass Gas, everyone. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes. Uh, joined as always by my co-hosts James Pumphrey, chugga chugga toot toot, and Joe Weber. Keep it juiced. Dang! <laughs> Dang, is that a new one? Wow. You are oh, just like IP God. It's like <laughs> <laughs> catchphrase after catchphrase, printing money, dude. <laughs> printing money. As I said in the intro, we're going to be talking about Option Magazine today. Admittedly, a topic I don't really know a lot about. I'm from more familiar with their video content on YouTube. That's made its way to YouTube nowadays. Um, but yeah, I didn't really grow up with this. I was more of a hot rod magazine kind of guy, if you can imagine that. Uh, do you guys know anything about Option Magazine? I thought you were going to ask if we know anything about hot rods. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know anything about hot rods? <laughs> Um, I don't know a lot of the story. I'm excited to uh, find out and talk about it. Uh, but Option Magazine, Option 2 was like the first really nerdy thing. Like the first like really car nerd thing that I did when I was, I was order Japanese magazines and videos off of eBay because I am old and was in high school before YouTube was a thing. So you... It wasn't like a subscription even for you. It was more like you had to find no, was, old issues. I was ordering old issues. Me and my friend Nathan would order old issues. Um, and we were like, what? The you, the pages go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have I don't have too much context on it. I, the only thing I know is from researching for different videos. And I think the HKS up to speed talks a little bit about it. But I know about like Daijiro but only in the context of like the early eighties, like trying to set speed records and stuff. So I know he's a crazy dude. I'm excited to see like more of his history. He's the editor in chief. Yeah. Right, of option. Uh, uh, I'm the editor in chief of donut. So sounds like pretty similar types of guys. He sets land speed records. I have a 16 pound golden doodle. Yeah. Pretty similar. I, would <laughs> yeah. say. I bought a baby pool uh, last weekend. <laughs> Yeah, what are you doing with that baby pool? Um, 
I wait till the sun warms it up and then I lay in it. Uh, you you <laughs> set a baby pool record for longest soak. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's like it's too, it's too cold. <laughs> it's too cold for me. That ground, that hose water is chilly, boy. It's it comes from underneath the ground. So I just put my feet in it <laughs> during uh, Casey and I have cocktail hour. Okay, let's let's oh, talk man. about options. <laughs> Yeah, I could go on a whole digression about how I wish I had a yard to put a baby pool in to have cocktail hour in. But it's not so much what Option Magazine covered that excites us, although we obviously love tuner cars and uh, the JDM market. It's the way that Option talked about cars that was most revolutionary. They treated cars like evolving, customizable beings that could be part of your personal expression and way of approaching the world. At the end of the day, cars were creative, and most importantly, fun. Like GTR R33 Speedwagon Mazda RX-7 Toyota Supra kind of fun. To really get the full picture, let's go into the past gas attic and find the boxes behind the ones labeled Halloween and Dad's Sports Memories <laughs> to the one labeled Vintage Car Magazines. That Dad's Sports Memories in like a Harry Potter sense, like it's just like bottles of mist that contain your father's memories and he takes them out and sniffs them. You put them in the pool, uh, the yeah. scrying pool. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Option Magazine was founded in 1981. Known as Option in Japanese, it was subtitled Exciting Car Magazine. 81 might sound like just a number, but keep in mind this was a full decade before an American audience really started getting into tuner culture and two decades before it reached its peak in the West, as the Fast and the Furious hit the box office and video games like Midnight Club were released. Even among magazines, Option beat most other tuner magazines to the presses by over a decade. For reference, the British tuner-centric mag Max Power was founded in 1993. I used to have a Max Power subscription. Oh, nice. Yeah? Yeah. Where they're like, Oi, governor, you're going to put us uh, uh, a... <laughs> some 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 dishes on there, mate. That was the and best you could gonna... think of. Dishes. <laughs> no, Max Power magazine was like super tacky. Like it had like the tackiest cars. Really? Yeah, like the most like hot import nights okay. type. Import Tuner magazine, an American-based magazine that also featured a mix of cars and scantily clad women, debuted in 1998. Yeah, the only Tuner mag is I'm really familiar with are Import Tuner mag and um, what's the other one? What's the Super what's the more Street. like Super Street? Thank you, James. There are four magazines that I would look for in the grocery store and ask my mom or dad to get me. So there is Import Tuner, which was like then and it was on a scale. So like Import Tuner was like very entry level. There are always like hot babes and like models, and there was like a literal centerfold where it was like this is yeah. Lacey. Her, this is her birthday. This is what she likes to do on the weekends. Then, and it was like not super technical. Then there was Super Street was like the next tier, which I thought was like, it was like really well written. It was a bit more technical. It was like cooler and like it didn't have a bunch of hot babes in it. And, but like classier, I think Super Street was my favorite. Then there was Sport Compact Car, which was like more technical. Mm. And I think less steezy but like really well written that's what dave used to write for dave was like yeah dave coleman fa my favorite writer when i was a kid whoa um and then uh turbo magazine was like it was a magazine full of the all the tech articles from the other magazines i don't even think i've heard of turbo there was like no glitz no uh no glitzies no just like t like t turbo trims I think I've heard of Turbo in passing, like researching videos and stuff like that, but I don't think I've ever seen a copy of Turbo Magazine. Definitely, I'm definitely most familiar with Import Tuner and uh, Super, why, why can't I ever think of it? Super, Super Street. Street. Super Street and Sport Compact Car were like the perfect level of like style and tech for me, like perfectly educational and well written and entertaining. Dave actually wrote this thing uh, that was like he did a fake reader's rides where like he took a reader's car and made it faster um but he just like cut all the body panels off of it and he got like all this like hate mail for it and i remember that was like the first time i read like that was like oh you can be funny with cars <laughs> i think like super street and import tuner had the most influence on what donut ended up being 
I'm just looking at this cover of uh, Turbo Magazine with Jay Leno on it, and he's got a Nas powered Shogun. That's yeah. so sick. With like box fenders on it. This thing looks amazing. Of course, in a broader sense, there were countless car magazines before Option. And to take it all the way back, the first ever car magazine launched a full century earlier in 1895 <laughs> and was known as. The horseless age. It has like a woman like <laughs> pulling up her long dress and you see like an inch of ankle. The October 3rd, 1900 issue, for example, featured articles and drawings of the Cunningham steam truck, ads for steam engines and Goodyear tires, and detailed diagrams of engine parts and vehicle designs. It set a template that would last decades among car magazines as they focused on delivering news on technical innovations, new models, and a focus on the touring lifestyle of enthusiasts who, before cars were even mainstreamed, uh, relied completely on these publications as a source of their information. As cars gained popularity and became a mainstay of culture worldwide, the auto magazine industry grew as well. The most popular magazine in terms of circulation numbers was Car and Driver, which began under the name Sports Cars Illustrated in 1955 before being renamed in 61. Car and Driver and its competitor Motor Trend represented the time and newsweek of the auto world, offering an authoritative, somewhat professorial voice with a straightforward focus on reviews of new models, test drives, and straightforward assessments and comparisons of competing models. Uh, car and Driver and Motor Trend really remind me of barber shops. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad, he didn't subscribe to those, but he, he'd always get a uh, hot rod street rotter and sometimes car craft um never we never had like review magazine so it was actually kind of like a treat to go to the barber shop and read like these very professional reviews of um sports cars it was cool it was into this buttoned up country club sort of environment that option boldly stepped it's no coincidence that mtv was founded in 1981 the same year as option it's totally fair to say that option was the car world's version of rolling stone the magazine's take on culture was rooted in the underground scene and always stayed subversive, a vast shift from its more corporate counterparts who relied on their close ties to the auto industry for exclusive previews of new cars. That sounds, I mean, I don't want to be like overly comparative, but I mean, that's kind of how Donut is too. We, we've done car reviews and we've gotten press cars, but we don't really do that sort of thing. We don't rely on that for our yep. stuff. Yeah. The first ever issue of Option was published in June of 1981 and set the tone perfectly for what this brave new world would look like. There was no glossy car featured on the cover, nor were there any sexy ladies. A feature of car magazines that would become increasingly popular as tuner magazines hit the mainstream. Instead, below the word Option, spelled out in hand-detailed neon red font, there's a darkly lit nighttime photograph from behind the driver's shoulder in the cockpit of a 1981 Mazda RX-7 that's been completely geared out for racing. The car is clearly on a public road, as red taillights appearing as long exposure squiggles in the distance. You can't see the driver who's wearing a white racing suit and matching white gloves. But we're not supposed to. The kind of driving he's doing, anonymity, is preferred. There's a bootleg feel to the whole image that's incredibly thrilling and illicit, even though there's no sexy lady in sight, it feels like something you should stash under your mattress. For comparison, the June 1981 issue of Car and Driver featured a preview of the 1983 Corvette, a feature on the Buick Regal versus the Toyota Supra, and a preview of the Mercedes-Benz W201. We're guessing this was not a tuned Supra that they were talking about. What Car and Driver promised was not access to the underground, but access to boardrooms and labs of major car companies. And hey, that's no knock against these other magazines. That's de there's definitely a place for that. Obviously, they're very successful. But what Option offered as an alternative was the magazine equivalent of an invitation to the after party. Ooh. And after that party, the hotel lobby. <laughs> Can I get a toot toot? <laughs> toot toot. <laughs> Can I get a beep beep? Beep beep. I, I don't really want to endorse that man. Yeah. I'm going to say right yeah. now, just knowing what we know from thumbnails design and everything, um, not the most eye-catching cover. 
I think it's pretty. Um, it makes it's definitely got my curiosity. It's more of like a zine than a, a car that, magazine, which I guess is the point. Yeah, but especially at the time, man. Like, can you imagine? Like, there wasn't anything like this, and now, like, it's like he's on a public road. He's wearing yeah. a racing suit, and the car, like the you know, he's got the interior is uh, not even that. Like, there's like wires kind of going over there. In the early years of his presence in Japan, Option actually pushed beyond edgy and courted real controversy for its support of tuning culture. At the time, any sort of car upgrades were often illegal simply because of the nature of Japan's automotive laws. Chief among those regulations were restrictions on horsepower and top speed on all vehicles driving in the country. In Japan, as of 1988, all cars were limited to, and I'm throwing up air quotes, 276 horsepowers and a top speed of 180 kilometers per hour or around 112 miles per hour. While the limit on horsepower was nixed in 2004, the throttle on speed remains as of 2020. What that meant was that almost the moment you started tuning your car in Japan, you were in violation of federal law. So a magazine about tuning cars in Japan was by default also a magazine about breaking the law, breaking the law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone heard my, car, my dog barking, but uh, it's because Nolan got more parts. Yes. Car companies in Japan were also leery of being associated with Option, given the legal gray area the magazine was promoting. While other magazines and media outlets were granted test drives on loaner cars, Option was not given the same opportunities, making them an outsider from the beginning. Again, similar to Donut. But while Option had its share of detractors, uh, they were overwhelmed by a younger cohort of Japanese drivers who, through tuner culture, we're forging new ways of connecting with the thriving Japanese automotive industry. As mentioned in our Motorex episode, the 80s were a boom decade for Japan. There was money to spend, and a lot of it was getting spent on cars. Meanwhile, the country was becoming urbanized at a mind-blowing clip. As from 1950 to 2015, the percent of Japanese population living in cities went from 53.4% to 93.5%. More subtle but also important to note was Japan's westernization and shift from a more communal society to one somewhere between the Japan of the old and the west. To put it simply, individualism in Japan was increasingly popular and customized cars were a popular way to express that newfound individualism. The 1980s wave of car culture in Japan perhaps most closely resembles what the U.S. experienced in the 60s with the rise of NASCAR, and the emergence of American muscle mainstays like the Camaro, the Mustang, the Charger, the Challenger. At the same time, as its focus and scope were entirely new, Options' emphasis on DIY and a personal relationship between driver and car harkened all the way back to the earliest car magazines like Horseless Age. And although Option frequently featured expensive supercars, they also reserved pages for covering cars that mere mortals could own. Like the Chevy Sonic... The the uh, Aveo, Daewoo, uh, Lanos. Dude, one day, like we're joking around. One day, I hope that it becomes like enough of a thing for us that we can just build, <laughs> like just like a sick like tube frame Daewoo Lanos like drag the car, the sickest Daewoo ever. Just like <laughs> yeah, yeah with Papadakis really and and just like make like a seven second <laughs> Lanos. Call it like the Lando <laughs> Nos, the Lanos Calrissian. <laughs> He's the guy who had the Millennium Falcon before Han Solo. I feel like there's like a, like so many so many movies back then had a scene where it's like, ah, yeah. you old pal, it's good to see you. Yeah. you fucking <laughs> this guy's <laughs> me over so many fucking times. He killed my wife and burnt down my house. But not before you killed my house and burnt down my and wife. Like, <laughs> ah, and then they big, <laughs> and then there's a big, big sweaty like ah, big old backpack hug. <laughs> you yeah. son of a sh piece of. <laughs> hey man, nothing personal. It's business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll see you in the sequel. We'll do it again. Uh, anyway. <laughs> All right, so what was it like to flip through Option during its peak in the 80s and 90s? The magazine has remained remarkably consistent since its early days, when it offered profiles of Japanese mechanics, ranked and categorized the fastest tuner cars that were on the scene, and told stories of the exploits and adventures of various street racers 
many of whom seemed more like fantastical characters than real life people. Quarter mile street racing, known as Zeroyan in Japan, sorry, I'm going to butcher that, Zeroyan in Japan, which translates to zero to 400 meters, was also a frequent topic. That's the same as 1320. At option, the writers weren't just car journalists. They were gonzo reporters, placing themselves Hunter S. Thompson style into the story by getting behind the wheel, under the hood, or on the track themselves. Their leader from the beginning was Daijiro Inada, the founder of the option, a legend in Japanese cartooner culture. Inada was editor-in-chief, and he set the tone from the top, setting world records for speed that we'll get much more into later in the episode. As far as the numbers for the magazine go, at its peak from 86 to 91, Option was printing between 350,000 to 400,000 copies of every issue. Massive numbers for any magazine, much less one focused on a specific subculture. We got 54 million views last month. Yeah, but people had to buy those. Ours is free. But I mean, it's just kind of like how it's like how media has changed. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, but how many lanyards did they sell? <laughs> we, did, we didn't sell any. We don't have any. <laughs> In 1988, Option branched out and started publishing Video Option, a monthly direct-to-video subscription service that expanded on many of the stories in the print magazine. Option Video heavily profiled the rise of drifting in Japan, sponsoring their own events, and even hosting one of the first ever drift events in the United States, held in California in 1996. I was born in 93. Damn, dude, I was born in 48. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I'm... <laughs> My dad had just come home from the war. <laughs> My gestation period was 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was when I came out I was the same oh, no. size that I am now. <laughs> this, this is actually the, sh the shirt that I came home from the hospital in. Uh <laughs> Video Option also published dubbed English versions of their videos for many years marketed as quote JDM Video Option. Like we found a clip of Video Option. Uh this one depicts Smokey Nagata and his quote lady friend. Is 200 miles per hour very quickly in 21 seconds. What an amazing feat. Or is he just crazy? No wonder he's a famed tuner. It features his le now legendary 197 mile an hour run on British freeways. Uh, he gets arrested in the video. Definitely suggest checking that out. Even with subtitles, it's impossible to understand. But what shines through is that these guys love cars and don't take them too seriously. You know, they also featured footage from the German Autobahn and footage from a tuner event. As chill as these guys are in video, there's definite danger involved. In fact, for its 200th volume option video, they put together a compilation of various high-speed crashes they captured on video over the years. I gotta go watch that. They're also setting insane speed records on closed tracks, including at the Bonneville Speed Trials in 1991 with a Nissan Z32, like you, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a Z31, but that's still pretty cool. Hey, maybe I should try to go 263.93 miles per hour in my car. Yeah, Dianata set a record uh, of 263.92. In the 80s and early 90s, tuner cars were widely considered unsafe by professional drivers, which was accurate, I guess. So the magazine staff often took the mantle of driving the cars themselves for their features, which is crazy. In addition to video option, the company also offered a wide range of different specialty publications over the years. These included Option Wagon, which focused heavily on modified MPVs, uh, Drift Tengoku, which translates to Drift Heaven Magazine, obviously focused on oh, the yeah. Japanese drifting scene. Great name, by the way. That's so good, dude. And G Works yeah, Magazine, so cool. a title focused on classic Japanese cars. There is also Option 2, which is a more technically focused magazine with detailed modding guides and DIY info. Much of Option's coverage in the 80s and 90s revolved around Hashiria, Japanese for street racers. These racers would compete on public roads, usually highways, where they would race each other. A typical form of racing within the club was to start at highway speeds, then try to race to the point where you could no longer be seen by your competitors. If you got to the point where no one could see you, you won. Whoa. That's sick. That's so, like, honorable. Like, it, 
it depends on the loser's perspective to call the race. That's so cool. Yeah. A lot of races profiled in option took place on Tokyo's Shuto Kos- oh. <laughs> Shuto Kosoku Doro. <laughs> Shuto, yeah. Shuto Kosoku Doro. Shuto Kosoku Doro. <laughs> or Metropolitan Expressway, a 44 <laughs> mile long series of toll roads around Japan with incredibly complex multi lane systems of merging traffic and frequent sharp turns. Racers would typically wait to compete until late at night when the roads were mostly, and mostly is definitely a key adjective here, uh, free of traffic. From the Shuto Expressway scene rose the most famous of the Hashiria gangs, the Midnight Club, which before it was ever a rock star game franchise was a real life gang of the most prominent Hashiria drivers in Tokyo. For more on the Midnight Club, you can go back and listen to our two part series we did a few months ago. Uh, it's really good. Do you guys talk about how they at first they met at 1145 and then they were like, <laughs> we should call this the 1145 Club. And then everyone was like, no, it doesn't have it doesn't have a good ring to it. No, we didn't cover that part. I didn't know that nice little tidbit. <laughs> it's too bad. Well, at first it was the noon club, but they were like way too many people <laughs> on the road. And they were like, this is too dangerous. And then they were like. And also, we're <laughs> really hungry. Why did we pick this I, time? <laughs> I had breakfast like four hours ago. I need another meal. It's actually how lunch was invented. Before 1981, <laughs> lunch did not exist. Yeah, Daijiro Inada was a lunch in actually in, in event. It was <laughs> breakfast and oh brunch, God. but people were like, "I'm too full." What's <laughs> what, what is a word uh, for late brunch? And they were like, "Lunch." Uh, <laughs> uh, a lunch yeah. stands for late have brunch. Breakfast and then they have brunch, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, I'm so full." And then the next meal was dinner, and they were like, "Oh, I'm like, I'm either yeah. too full or too hungry. We need to shift this stuff around." It was first it was lunch and then dinner. We don't need a lunch, yeah, and a dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, everyone got super fat for a good decade. Nolan is Nolan's just rubbing yeah, his Nolan, eyes. Look alive, bud. You gotta be on these so roofs too. That was. Uh... <laughs> No one's just like <laughs> quite a yarn you guys are spinning. Uh, quite a quite a bit. Um, I think people are really gonna enjoy the no, breakfast but I, brunch but even lunch like, dichotomy I, I was, rants. I, was, I think that's really gonna add a lot <laughs> to the flavor of this podcast. When I was on script one, Nolan, this is the magic that people come here for, okay? <laughs> this is what separates us from the rest of the pack. Two, even when I was on book, even when I was on script, I noticed you just <laughs> <laughs> Longing and staring sorry, I, outside. I'm sorry. Come over to my house. We'll fing throw the ball around or some. All right, let's go. Tell me more. All right. Please tell me more, James. A great example of the close <laughs> a great example of the close relationship between Midnight Club and Option is the story of the most legendary of the Midnight Cars, a heavily modified Porsche 930 nicknamed Blackbird. Blackbird was also known as the Yoshida Special 930. After its legendary owner, doctor by day, racer by night, Yoshida Aichi, the founder of the Midnight Club. Allegedly. 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 Not only did... Oh, that's why the Midnight Club is so cool. It's like, this guy's a doctor. He knows how the human body works. <laughs> but he also feels the need to drive 200 miles per hour. Amazing. I love doctors. They saved my life. Not only did Option frequently publish stories and images on Blackbird, in 2011 it ran a story on its specs, showing the value of the magazine's links to the underground scene. Literally, secrecy was so important uh, to these guys because you're competing against other people. You don't want to tell them how you did it. So uh, you weren't going to get these numbers anywhere else. Here's what Option reported about blackbird in that 2011 story and also this is like 20 years after <laughs> the car featured the stock 3.3 liter flat six engine but it had been modified almost beyond recognition these upgrades included a widened bore of 98 millimeters to increase engine capacity by 100 cc's as well as titanium rods and can shafts and a bigger intercooler with these modifications as well as a dual ignition system the car made 600 and one hearse purrs oh. 
and 701 newton meters of torque, which is how many pound feet? Uh, I'm. Let's guess. I think it's 420. No, I think it's more than that. I'm going to say... I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor this week, Mint Mobile. Breaking up your old wireless provider just got a whole lot easier thanks to Mint Mobile. They were actually the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, and now Mint Mobile is introducing their unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. An unlimited plan for just 30 bucks. You're going to spend three times the amount on any other provider. It's all going to be at least 90 bucks a month. So you tired of paying too much for your mobile bill? Switch over to Mint. They don't have any stores. They're only online. So they, they don't have that overhead that other stores do like T-Mobile and Sprint and stuff. And they pass the savings on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint mobile plan and keep your same phone number. That's pretty cool. And if you're not 100% satisfied with Mint Mobile, they have you covered with a seven day money back guarantee. Break up with your big wireless provider and switch to Mint Mobile's premium unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash GAS. That's mintmobile.com slash gas. Guys, today's sponsor is Valvoline Oil, the first patented motor oil brand, making them the original motor oil. Their innovations include the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, and the first synthetic blend oil. They've been doing this for over 150 years. Can't go wrong with some Valvoline. But if that's not enough for you, Valvoline is better than ever now with 40% better wear protection than industry standards. Every motor oil that Valvoline makes has been reformulated to provide better protection against the four major causes of engine breakdown. You got heat, friction, deposits, and wear. And now Valvoline protects against all four of them better than ever because an original never stops improving. That's right, because Valvoline doesn't just meet industry standards, they exceed them, okay? They've got their advanced full synthetic oil. It's proven to maximize engine life with 40% uh, better wear protection than industry standards. The advanced full synthetic also has advanced protection in stop and go driving, much like I do in LA. 10 times better protection against heat, 25% better deposit protection than industry standards, and it meets or exceeds GF6 standards. And then you got Valvoline's full synthetic high mileage oil, uh, which I probably need because it's proven to maximize engine life after 75,000 miles with 50% better wear protection than industry standards, 10 times better protection against heat, 25% better deposit protection than industry standards, and it meets or exceeds those GF6 standards. But it's also the first high mileage motor oil. Guys, you know that Valvoline is the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where their scientists are able to run specialized engine tests and standardized engine tests right in their own facility, which allows their scientists more freedom and flexibility to innovate. Anyway, all Valvoline oils exceed industry standards and provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road, including yours. Join the Valvoline family. Not only will you be joining the entire donut family, we all have Valvoline in our car, but you'll also join Chris Forsberg from Formula D, our boy. You got the Hendrix Motorsports team, Clay Milliken over there in the NHRA top field class, and historic Valvoline drivers such as Mark Martin and Mario Andretti. Come on. Go get yourself some Valvoline for your car. You won't regret it. So thank you, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. So I was totally wrong. And James, you were pretty, or yeah. Joe, you are pretty close. Yeah, and I was just doing mine as a joke. I was trying to look it up, and I was going to um, guess the exact number. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to use Google. Yeah, I messed up, and I looked up... Uh, 701 pound feet of newton meter which is 950. <laughs> every customization choice for the porsche was geared toward the lengthier highway races for which the midnight club was famous after all it's one thing to blow past 200 miles per hour in a drag race for a few seconds and entirely another thing to sustain high speeds down a long stretch of the chuteau expressway temperature sensors on the exhaust connected to a gauge in the cockpit were installed to keep an eye on overheating. The balance of endurance and speed is fascinating to see in such a heavily customized car. And while the power is impressive, so are the refinements like a secondary transmission cooler housed in the left rear wheelhouse. 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 Hey. <laughs> <laughs> 
Although the roll cage and harnesses tell you that the car is built for racing, the interior feels more refined than your typical race car. With white leather bucket seats and a tritone steering wheel from a 964 Carrera RS. In contrast to its one-of-a-kind bespoke set of parts, the exterior of Blackbird is understated and not that far from the stock version of the car with a dusty maroon paint job and a subtly dropped front bumper. Midnight is spelled out as two separate words in white cursive on the windshield. A subtle yet shadowy finish seems perfectly fitting for the founder of an organization called the Midnight Club. Blackbird was Ooh, actually yeah. maroon. huh? If you feel like this is a lot of detail on a single car, you'd be right. But that's what Option Magazine was all about. No detail was too small. No tuning choice or part unworthy of discussion and deliberation. Unlike many other tuner magazines, there weren't sexy models on the cover of Option. Maybe for the simple reason that it would have taken up space that could otherwise be used for specs. By the way, the sexy model thing is really something that needs to be mentioned when we talk about tuner magazines. As we mentioned before, if you uh, look up tuner magazine covers, you'll see what we're talking about. It's something that feels pretty dated now. Yeah. Although it's weird to call something dated, that's still commonplace. Yeah. For example, the Super Street Network, which still publishes Super Street European Car Import Tuner and Honda Tuning, still has a girls tab on their website. Can you imagine we had like a girls playlist? <laughs> Yeah. Like on Donut. It's like, just weird. It's like, up to speed, wheelhouse, money pit, high low, girls, showgirls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it does feel very, it's, 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 it's an old thing now. It's like, yeah, that's one thing I do like about, I mean, I like a lot of things about print journalism, but you know, I think a lot of car magazines are, are, are focusing more on the cars themselves rather than like the ancillary stuff like that, that doesn't really add a lot to the conversation you yeah know? you know we're gonna get a bunch of comments that are like oh wow these guys don't understand whatever i mean no they put the they put the the models on the cover with the cars so you buy the magazine you know yeah it's just it's it's geared towards you know eight-year-old ten-year-old me yeah whereas like import tuner i'm like but no, it's mom. It's a car magazine. So <laughs> yeah. I want it because it's cars. So I, get, you know, which is like it's, 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 it's objectifying women because it's marketing it only towards yeah, boys. Yeah, I mean so that's like what it is. It's, it's objectifying. It's keeping, that's that's what it is. And by objectifying, it's keeping girls out of it. So you know, there's less women in the space, which I think is a thing that we need to address. Yeah. Option, on the other hand, had cars on the covers. Brightly colored, heavily tuned, heavily decaled streetcars that were sometimes sexy, but more often just plain fun to look at. Maybe that's the key difference. Other tuner magazines were trying to market a complete fantasy package to the horn dog and adolescent boy. Boom. As you were talking about, James. <laughs> sure, option was somewhat of a fantasy too, but that fantasy was far less wet dream and more multicolored anime montage. The man with the vision for options car centric celebration of tuner culture was Dayanada. But Inada's influence on the Japanese car world went far beyond option. In addition to the magazine, he co-founded the D1 Grand Prix in Japan in 2000, a prominent drifting competition that helped popularize the sport and codify much of its competitive standards. He also co-founded the Tokyo Auto Salon in 1983, a Whoa. tuner-focused alternative to the long-running mainstream Tokyo Motor Show. I definitely want to hit the Auto Salon up sometime. It's a dream of mine. It's such a dream of mine to go to uh, the Tokyo Auto Salon with... Uh... Ken Gushi <laughs> or like die. Like, yeah. And just I, be like, dude, I would love to go with die. I want to yeah. go with die. And then that He's dude, uh, you, you, he was like, I'll take you to the Tokyo auto salon and you take me to SEMA. That's so fun. All right. So the auto salon is still going strong in 2020, where in January it attracted over 300,000 fans and over 800 officially displayed cars. Highlights of this year's show included the Nissan GTR 50 and a tile design reimagining of the GTR. Giorgetto! <laughs> as well as something called the Honda Civic Cyber Knight Japan Cruiser. <laughs> a reimagining of the 1997 Civic, which was described by Honda as a modern presence that shines in Neo Japan, where the near future, rather, and underground are mixed up, which sounds really cool. It is really cool. Um, I love this thing. While these ventures are separate from option, they are also highly complimentary. 
both events inevitably found their way into the pages of Anada's magazine. It's lot. It's a lot less radical than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. Which I kind of, which I enjoy. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's funny what you can do. Not to, not to bag on anybody, but like I'm so used to everything being like wide bodied and slammed with huge, like crazy offset wheels. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just a lot of arrow. But like cars like this really are a reminder that you don't have to do that to make something unique. Yeah, and I think like the Honda scene especially. Um, exercises a lot of subtlety in modification which i really enjoy like vtech club they have like single overhead cam classes and stuff which is cool dianata himself was born in nagasaki in 1947 a city that just two years prior had been devastated by an atomic bomb his childhood directly coincided with nagasaki and japan's economic recovery as the country rapidly modernized he embraced the modern age, especially when it came to cars. As soon as he turned 18, the minimum age for drivers in Japan, he got his license and started racing. His main haunt was the same Shudo Expressway that would later become home to the Midnight Club. In his own words from a 2019 profile on option, quote, I'm still not good at driving, but I was worse back then. <laughs> when I got my license and I bought a car, I went driving every night. Public roads are really the only place to practice driving. Well, I could go to the circuit on Sundays, but I was able to drive in town at night, and that was plenty of practice. <laughs> Inada attended university, but soon dropped out and got a job as a truck driver. In his own words, he wanted a, quote, speedy life, meaning a life where he was behind the wheel as much as possible. He continued to build his skills. Because of the inferior control of his car at the time, a Hino Contesso Coupe, Inada relates the way he, quote, steadily acquired the skill of counter-steering and drifting. The Tokyo Metropolitan Expressway was naturally my circuit. I often drove close behind my senpai. I was desperate to improve. I want to go driving at night, you know? Who's your senpai? Me? My senpai? I don't... I'm 100% Nolan's senpai. No, you're, you're a worse <laughs> driver than Nolan. No, but Nolan's, Nolan's not a professional driver. Nolan's a professional YouTube host. <laughs> True. I suck at driving. Me too. I'm the second fastest person at Donut right now. Well, no, you're the first fastest. No, I think Max actually beat me by like a tenth of a second for a hot lap. All right, well, that's still pretty good. Uh, let's see. Inada soon started working as a journalist for Autosport magazine, which was published by a Japanese company called Sanai. Inada clearly performed well within the company because by 1981, he had convinced them to found Option, with Inada himself at the helm as the 34-year-old editor-in-chief. I was a 34-year-old editor-in-chief. Boom. Senpai. Are you 34? No, I'm 35, but I was 34 when I got the title. I look well, 33 because that's the year that Jesus died and I have a beard. Can't argue with that. As Option gained in popularity, Inada became increasingly known through articles reporting his speed testing exploits, which at first were conducted on the now-closed Yatabi High Speed Testing Course outside of Tokyo. Over the years, Anata traveled the world to test and race JDM tuners, including at the Bonneville Speedway in Utah and the Nürburgring in Germany. A frequent event for Anata was the Silver State Classic Challenge, held since 1988 on State Route 318 in Nevada, and is widely considered the fastest road race in the world. I really want to go to this sometime. I want to go to it looks that. Looks awesome. Anata's outings at the Silver State Classic are a great example of how Option approached journalism. With every step of the journey documented in the pages of the, of the magazine, in 1999, Anada traveled to Nevada to try to set a speed record with the same skyline, specifically a 1999 Blitz GTR R3 28 he had raced down the Autobahn in Germany. On his first outing in Nevada, Anada ran out of fuel and failed to beat the speed record, but he was determined to return and try again. Four years later in 2003, he would, this time with what Option called the Stream Z, a heavily modified Nissan 350Z known as the Fairlady Z33 in Japan. This time, Inada got to 6,800 RPM on sixth gear at a speed of 205 miles an hour, but his left rear wheel burst, Whoa. costing him to barrel over 10 times. He rolled the car 10 times. Dang. Inada was lucky and escaped with only a few bruises, although keep in mind this is a 57-year-old man we're talking <laughs> about at this point. <laughs> wow. This guy is a total bad. Dude, yeah. This is amazing. That's so cool. Can you imagine going 205 in a Z? <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I like the Z. I love the Z. I'm just saying it's that it's a small car, you know? 
Yeah, but it's a very solid chassis. Yeah. It does feel so planted. I love these long nose. I fought to get the long nose version of the Bomex kit that we got. Oh, uh, yeah. That would... You guys should have gone with that. I know. It looks, it looks cooler. Listen, I have the best taste at donut. I have the best <laughs> taste at donut. You know what? Alex said, Alex, Steezy Alex, yeah. from Kickflip, editor of Bumper to Bumper, former editor of Wheelhouse, said that I am the best dressed person at donut. Alex doesn't usually give compliments. That's pretty cool. I don't even think I don't even think Alex likes me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't, but he told me in a meeting. Jesse was there. I'd be better dressed if I allocated more money for clothing. I spend my money on dumb shit, like racing sims and Chrysler parts. I used to go two years without buying any article of clothing. And then like all my all my clothes have like holes in my jeans and mustard stains on my shirts. And I'm like, I got to be an adult now. I used to only wear free clothes. Like, I used to only wear, <laughs> like, borrowed shirts that I never gave back. <laughs> oh, we're going out? Oh, uh, you mind if I borrow a shirt? Like, <laughs> like I can't you can't even imagine that now. <laughs> like, oh, cool. Can I just, like, borrow this shirt? <laughs> <laughs> All right, where was I? The next three years, Anada returned to the course with modified versions of the Stream Z, but the car troubles kept plaguing his attempts. In 2006, the car had 900 horsepower, a hundred kilogram meters of torque, which I'm not sure what that is. A VQ35 bored out to 3.8 liters and a huge turbo. Hopes were high, but the engine experienced a massive failure throwing parts all over the road. Don't turbo Zs, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't turbo Zs. <laughs> and although he failed by the magazine standards that had been a success. He should have gone VR. He should have gone VR, like Chris Forsberg. As you might know from watching High Low, it can be really fun to watch someone struggle with a car. For his part, after 2006, Anata retired from racing. Now in his 70s, wow. he's still involved with Option. Anata claims that he still has a, quote, Hashiria soul. Hell yeah. And that his, quote, weariness goes away when I'm driving, which is a great... I mean, ideally, man, thing. like in my 70s, like I don't want to be like as active in Dublin <laughs> as I am now. <laughs> like I don't want to like clock in every day. But like, I'd love to be like an advisor of some sort. Like, that's when all the Zoomers will be all the hosts. All the hosts will be Zoomers. They'll have neon green hair. Yeah, all, all the hosts will be Crystal Children. That's the news. <laughs> called, no, I'm serious. They're called Crystal Children. Why? What? Because they're coming up and they're like, I don't know. Gender is fluid. Sex is whatever. What is binary? Like, they all just have this like communal like understanding of each other. Like. Nobody hates anybody. It's like not cool to be mean. All right. I understand. I like, I dig that. Like for the, it's like the first generation in American history where like, if you're an well, you're not cool. Yeah. Yeah. I dig that. But I, I, I think they can come up. They should come up with something. They should manifest a better name than crystal children. How about that? Yeah. I mean, or no name. I mean, what is the name even dude? All right. Let's move. <laughs> <laughs> Much like its legendary founder, Option Magazine is still going strong. You can visit an English language version of the site at option slash Tokyo.com. It's a dash. <laughs> is it a dash or is it a slash? Yeah, oh, no. It's God, a no. It's, well, a, it's, it's a, a dash. dash. It is Slashes a dash. and dashes are it different. It's a dash. <laughs> you can visit an English language version of the site at option dash Tokyo.com. And as of the day that we are recording this episode, Top stories on the English language site include a feature on a 780 horsepower Toyota Century, Toyota's flagship luxury sedan in Japan. Uh, I talk about it in the first episode of D-List, cars we didn't get in America. There's also a profile on Smokey Nagata, who in 1998 was arrested on the A1 north of London while driving a gold-painted RB26 powered Supra. In classic option fashion, there's even a cartoon of Nagata getting hauled away by two baton-wielding British bobbies with the golden Supra visible in the background. That video is really good. They're like, they're harassing him about his video cameras. They're like, what is, where's the videotape? Oi, where's the videotape? And then they just arrest him. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Awesome, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, I don't speak English. I don't speak any English, like in a pretty good English accent. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> There's also an interesting report on so-called roulette runners, young drivers who blast around the Tokyo Metropolitan Expressways at breakneck speeds. One driver by the name of, of Yuya Namiki, a 20-year-old restaurant worker, had been arrested after colliding with a sidewall on a busy stretch of highway at 100 miles per hour. His car had been heavily tuned and the license plate concealed. The article features various reactions from tuning insiders, including this quote from a former street tuner referred to as Mr. S that basically sums it up. You almost have to laugh at this kind of news. It seems he was driving on cheap Nankang AR1s and had no regard for himself or others driving like that on Tokyo highways. That said, it's been happening for decades already now, so it's really nothing new. <laughs> if you're going to drive that fast, you should uh, get some uh, R compound tires. You should get some high-speed rated tires. We'll get back to more past gas, but right now, a word from our sponsors. Big thanks to MyBookie.com for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. If you go right now to MyBookie.com and enter the code GAS, MyBookie will match your first deposit up 2000 bucks. That's free money. And I'm forced to say that it's winning season at MyBookie.com. What does that mean, Joe? What, that could mean a lot of things. Winning season could mean, uh, I don't know, a new episode of uh, Three and a Half Men. It doesn't. Winning season at MyBookie.com means doubling your first deposit. It means survivor. It means super contests and squares and all your favorite types of betting. Winning season means hitting all your parlays and props with your feet up while you're hanging out with your homies watching games. There's a ton of sports on right now. It's fun to watch all of them. NFL is coming back. From live betting to championship futures, every play you want to make is at mybookie.com. It's simple. You make your picks, you win big, you collect your cash. Capiche? All you got to do is enter the code GAS and mybookie.com will match your first deposit up to a thousand bucks. I think that's a pretty good deal. Your winning season begins today only at mybookie.com. I want to thank our sponsor for this week, Surfshark VPN. Chances are you're listening to this show through the power of the internet. Chances are you discovered this show because of the internet. Everything we do is through the internet. Our internet reliance is rapidly increasing from streaming our favorite shows like this one to keeping in touch with our loved ones. Even our banking is done online these days. We'd like to think that our information is safe, but as our online footprint increases, so does our need for proper security. That's where Surfshark VPN comes into play. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all the data you send through the internet, keeping anyone unwanted from seeing it. That could be, you know, unscrupulous hackers, or more uh, frightening in my opinion, your internet service provider. Another great reason to use a VPN is because content from streaming services can be restricted based on what your country you're in. It's stupid, but because of copyright and trademark and all that kind of stuff, that's just how it works. With a VPN like Surfshark, you can get around those restrictions. Trick your ISP into thinking that you're in a different country and get to watch cool stuff. Right now, Surfshark has a really great deal, you guys. Enter code PASSGAS and you'll get 85% off plus three months free. All that for just a few dollars a month and you're fully protected. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you try it and don't like it, you can cancel your subscription easy as that and get your money back. It's great. So remember that's past gas to get 85% off and three free months. Thank you Surfshark for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to the show. Clearly the Hashabia tradition continues and just like with any youth based trend, the media will continue to come up with new ways to label and criticize it. According to an article on a mainstream Japanese news site, these roulette gangs have been thriving during the pandemic, where decreased road traffic has made it easier than ever to race on public highways. While car culture has obviously moved on as magazines and print media have become virtually obsolete, the impact of option is clear. Just remember, for most of the time that cars have been around, magazines were the only way you could learn about these cars. And what was in the magazine was what you got. You couldn't do an additional Google search or watch another YouTube video. The internet has obviously opened the door for car enthusiasts to run wild, but there's also something really special about the not-so-distant past where information was a scarce resource. Like all media, the future of option lies in online and video content. It definitely seems like they've been able to adapt, and after almost 40 years, they're still going strong. So check out Option Online or order a couple of copies of the magazine. Even if you can't read Japanese, it's a really special treat to actually hold a physical copy in your hands. 
And just like Dai Inada and Option did in 1981, if you're not seeing stuff you care about represented in a greater culture, start telling these stories yourself. Be the option you wish to see in the world. <laughs> As for us, we know that Donut would not be what it is today without Option Magazine. That's inspiration enough for all of us. Dude, I swear, it's like I used to, like before the internet, I used to be able to look at like eight cars a month. Like I would get a magazine <laughs> and I would be able to learn about like eight cars a month. So I'd like start with all the features. Yeah. You know, like the magazine features. And then I would like move into like the tech articles. I would like reread every word of a magazine when I was a kid because I was, I was just so thirsty for information. Like, I don't want to be like kids today don't know how good they got it because I, I honestly think like it's not necessarily better this way. Like, I think like the scarcity and like the having to find it, there is something to be said about that, you know? And like, yeah. And you don't really appreciate cars because you don't get to spend as much time with any one individual car that you're researching like or just reading about like i feel like anything that's posted is like more surface level than ever before you just kind of mm -hmm. like oh here like the here's the horsepower rating here's the torque here's what it can do zero to 60. so then if you present a car at all and say this is a special car there's always going to be people that are going to be like yeah well this this other car makes that much more horsepower this makes whatever like easy to pick it apart other things and things are less special now i feel well, like. yeah and also the ability to talk to the person who puts it out yeah i agree um i definitely want to go and order some old option mags right now <laughs> all right well thank you so much for joining us this week on past gas yeah i had a lot of fun learning about this magazine i'll definitely be checking out the option video for sure. Uh, special thanks to Kanan, as always, and Thomas. Follow the show. Follow us on social media. Nolan J. Sykes, James Pumphrey, Joe G. Weber, Donut Media. Follow us on all the socials. Be kind. Whatever you do, stay fired up. Toot toot, more power, baby. Hearse purrs, buff horses. I love you. 